and the Fine Theology at St. Andrew's College alongside, alongside Michaud, John. Um, so in the talk is going to be our orthodox approach to mission and what that means in our lives. So thank you, Jason, for coming today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I know there's not a lot of people here, but um, we're very interested to hear your talk. And thank you for letting us record it as well. So when you're, whenever you're ready, thank you so much. Thanks, Antoinette. Um, so when I was organising this talk, when Father John asked me, he, I was thinking I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, something that probably hasn't been done before as long as I can remember. So um, I came up with this topic, an orthodox approach to mission. Um, we don't really talk about it much, unfortunately, but tonight we will talk about it, we'll learn about it, and hopefully um, this can be a beginning or a foundation for future things to come. So this is the roadmap for tonight. We'll look at um, the motives of Orthodox mission, the aims of, of mission, uh, two different approaches, the two types of missions, um, examples of missionaries, and then we'll look at just a very short history to understand um, the situation that we are in Australia, the Australian diaspora, as I'll call it there. And then a um, sort of like a summary, everything that's been covered, and then something uh, moving forward, what we can take from tonight's um, session. Does anyone know, is everyone familiar with mission, or anyone not familiar with it, the term mission, missionaries, missionizing? Yeah, what does it mean? Tell me. I don't think it is. Alright, so basically, um, mission is when you, um, as Christians, we're supposed to share the gospel with others. So, it's a very basic sense. That's what we're talking about. So, for those who are um, very systematic or logical, analytical, I've put little shortcut labels next to each heading, each section. Um, just to give you an idea of the logic behind how I structure tonight's presentation. Um, the first one is why we should mission, basically. Uh, that, um, what does it hope to achieve or what do we hope to achieve? How do we do it? The how. So the why, what, how. Where. Where does it happen? Uh, who. Who we can look at as examples. And then uh, tying it into our situation and then moving forward. I'm, um, I'm pretty flexible, so if you guys have any questions along the way, I say something doesn't make sense, just put your hand up. So before I move on to the motives, um, it kind of happened by coincidence or providence with today's um, lecture and the, um, the gospel reading today. Anyone notice which gospel reading it was? From the Gospel of John. Very famous, most probably one of the most well-known famous gospel readings in um, that most people, most Christians can quote. It was John, basically um, around John three sixteen. So John three thirteen to three seventeen. If you know the one about um, for God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son, etc., etc. So when we talk about the why, the first one is love of God. And this that's what tonight's gospel reading was about, today's gospel reading. Um, well, for, for God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. Um, when we say love of God as a, motive, as a reason to motivate us, or as a why, a why that we should mission, um, it's because God has loved us first, so we should love others and love God back in return, in, in a basic sense, you know. Um, this gospel reading, it doesn't say, um, for God so loved the world that he just left it in its own, you know, corruption um, to, to, you know, to be destroyed. No, he loved the world so he actually did something. What did he do? He sent his only son. That sent is um, what we're talking about in mission writing, being sent. So it's very um, relevant to the, today's um, gospel reading. 
So the first one is love of God, the second one is love of neighbor. <coughs> So if you remember in the Gospels, Christ says that um, you know, the whole of the law can be summed up by love of God, love of neighbor. So this is that ultimately should motivate us in almost everything that we do in our Christian life, but um, particularly with missionizing, for example. The third one is um, inner necessity or self-compulsion. And that's, that's, you could say, the, the result of the love of God and love of neighbor. And I'll put a quote there from St. Paul, who says um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yes, woe to me if I preach not the gospel. So what St. Paul is talking about there is repeating the same thing twice, um, once in the um, affirmative and once in the negative, where he says that um, necessity is laid upon me and work to me if I don't do it. So that same feeling of necessity and feeling of um, woe should also, we should have that same feeling as well for preaching the gospel, as what St. Paul's talking about in, in this um, uh, verse from Corinthians. And the fourth. Um, reason is the, what's called the Great Commission. Does anyone know what the Great Commission is? It's uh, yeah. is it um, sort of the last thing that, that Jesus first said? So he said, "Go out." You know, yeah, you... pretty much. So it's found in um, in Matthew and in mm -hmm. some of the other Gospels as well. But I've taken the quote from Matthew uh, twenty-eight nineteen, where he says, um, "Go therefore." Make and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. For lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So he's telling us, he's giving us an imperative command. He's telling the disciples, go. And what we need to understand is that, you know, we spoke about John 3.16 and about God's love and then Christ and then God sending his son and then Christ's mission on earth, you know, to, to restore people, to help people so they can find salvation, you know. Um, Christ's mission is the church's mission. It's the same mission. So what Christ was doing in his life, in his ministry, that we read about in the Gospels, is what the church should be doing in our life, in our ministry here today. And... Um, an example of this is in, um, for example, in the Creed. The Creed is made up of 12 articles. So each section of the Creed is an, is an article of faith. And the, um, the ninth article, which I'm sure you all know, expresses four attributes of the church. What are those four attributes? One holy Catholic apostolic. Thank you. What do we understand about the apostolic attribute? What does that mean to us when we say that every week or every time we read the creed? What does it mean that we believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church? What does that apostolic mean? Maybe, um, you know, I guess the apostles carried out the work of Christ and therefore we, we go and from their example so we continue their work and their mission. Yeah. So um, the word apostolic in there actually has four meanings and that's one of them. And that's the most relevant to what we're talking about tonight. Um, the other um, meaning is um, we believe that we have an apostolic faith. So we're the same faith as the um, apostolic as the apostles. Um, there's also the apostolic succession, which can be traced back through our bishops. And yeah, and as you mentioned, the um, because the root of the word apostolos in Greek is one who is sent. You know, Christ sends the apostles. You know, St. Paul was out missionizing the um, Asia Minor region, um, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to the, to the world back there. So I think we have some pretty good reasons that we should 
want to do this. So now we need to look at what's the target? What are we trying to aim for? You know, whenever we do, whenever people plan, you know, a, a structure or they're planning an event or they're planning something, they need to think about what are we trying to achieve? What's the aim? Which brings us to our next section. So just before I bring it up, since we're a small group, what do you guys think? What's the aim of us going out and baptizing all nations, you know? Teaching them about Jesus Christ. What do you think we are trying to aim for? What are we trying to achieve? Any ideas? Remember I said Christ's mission is the same as the church's mission, which is our mission. What was Christ doing? What was he doing in his, in his ministry on earth? It's going to be very obvious when you see it. Healing of the fallen condition, right? Remember I said, um, John, uh, the Gospel of John, it doesn't say, for God so, so loved the world that he just left it in its you know, wickedness and then just, you know, didn't bother. No, he actually wanted to heal it, heal the fallen condition. That's, that's one of the main aims. And you see that a lot in the Gospels when you read about um, Jesus Christ, you know, obviously, for miracles, healing people. Too many examples, which I'm sure you all know about. Reconciliation, you know, um, with God and with the rest of creation. So, through, you know, humanity's sin and our fallenness and our wickedness, we, in a way, we become separated from God and also separate from other people. The relationships are broken down, in other words. So, one of the aims of the Orthodox Church of the Orthodox Mission is to restore that relationship, to reconcile man with God and man with man, if that makes sense. Or human person with human person. And we have um, there Christ with, um, that's a zoom, zoom in image of the um, prodigal son. <coughs> but on top of these two aims there's actually a third aim that's um, possibly more important or maybe the same what do you think, what else could, could there be what did we just do now just upstairs in the music mm. hmm? communion communion, yeah, what yeah. else well that communion is the part of that reconciliation and the healing Yep, what else? Heard the gospel. Heard the gospel, yep. Which is very generally, very abstractly, the whole, rough, not specific thing, just generally what we do, the whole service, what we're we doing. Praying. Praying. Praying, yeah. Coming together. Coming together. How else could you say it? Communion. Oh, that's one word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I already said that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in general, he doesn't. So the paramount name. Is the glorification of God. We came and we glorified God. Mm -hmm. Now glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. You know? um, Christ talks about that, you know. He's the glory of the Father. Things like that. Um, so that people will see good works and glorify our Heavenly Father, etc. etc. So that's you could say the paramount aim, the, the most highest aim, is the glorification. Who is worshipped, as I mentioned, in spirit and truth. Which um, the Gospel of John only speaks to the um, Samaritan woman. And also I've got another quote here from St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31. He says, Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So whatever we're doing, that's what we should keep in mind. Keep that in mind. I don't think we'll go too far. So, so far we've looked at the why and, the, and what does it hope to achieve. Now we're going to look at the how. And just before we move on to the next slide, I just wanted to um, let you guys know that at the end there might be some questions, so we'll see how you go. Hopefully you can answer them. It's a small group, so you guys can do it. It's a small
small groups that you guys Okay. So this, I mentioned earlier on there's two pr approaches. The first approach is called the incarnational approach. Um, what's the incarnation? God becoming man. Yeah. So it's a vision? What did you say? Well, like in context of mission, what is the incarnation approach? Just generally, what's, what's the incarnation? The incarnation. <coughs> when we say the incarnation, what's that? What are we talking about? The transfer from one body to another. Not really, because God didn't really have a body before he took the flesh. Born. Hmm? To be born? Yeah, to be born. So what then it's really like on there? That's part of the incarnation. Incarnation, so it's to, to come in, to take on flesh. Incarnation. Yes. Yeah. So to become part of flesh. But when we talk about incarnation in the Orthodox Church, people usually think it's referring to the nativity, you know, the incarnation of Christ. Your nativity of Christ our Lord. But it refers to that, but it doesn't only refer to that. It refers to his whole life on earth, his whole earthly life. So, the incarnation can refer to um, him being born or him coming down on the Virgin Mary uh, for the Holy Spirit, but it can also refer to, and most of the time it's referred to as Jesus' whole ministry and life on earth. You know, from, um, from his birth to his um, public ministry to his, um, you know, to, to healing, to death on the cross, to the resurrection, to the ascension, all that is actually part of the incarnation. Um, so just remember that. So, so basically, that, that's a that's a theological dogma when we're talking about incarnation. It's what we believe. We believe that, you know, Christ was God, the second person of the Trinity, coming down. And we say it in our creed. Um, took flesh from the Virgin Mary and became man. You know? These are dogmatic statements. But our dogmas translate to how we do things in the church and how we do things in the world. They're not just abstract things that we just believe in just because that's what they are. They actually affect how we um, how we deal with others and everything like that. So I'll give you an example. So when we talk when I talk about the incarnational approach, I'm talking about the approach that we take when we're missionizing, which is to incarnate to give birth in a way to the gospel into a new culture, if that makes sense, or into a new place. We're giving birth to that. So these are the key important elements. You know, when Christ became man, you know, he lived amongst people. He spoke the language that the people could understand. He ate, he walked, he wore the same clothes. He was um, incarnated um, just like how we are. Well, we're not incarnated, but I mean, he was like us. Everything except for sin. So when we do, when we incarnate the gospel, we need to do the same thing. So when I say, when we um, vernacular language, anyone know what that means? No. Mm -hmm. Just means the common everyday language that everyone can understand. You know, when the um, New Testament was written, it was written in Greek. Um, it wasn't written in, in Hebrew or anything like that, it was written in Greek. But at the time there was different types of Greek available. There was like a very, you could say, formal or philosophical high level Greek that not many people could understand. Just only um, very well educated people and philosophers could understand. But there was a very basic common Greek which is called which was called common Greek or in Greek Koine Greek. That was the Greek that the um, disciples chose to use because they wanted to pick the most the language that most people could understand in the known world. Um, that's the vernacular language. So that includes obviously the scripture, divine services, holy books, things like that. And the second element is strong catechetical education in the vernacular, you know. So we have to educate people in their language in ways that they can understand. You know, when Christ came, he spoke in parables. He spoke about very everyday basic things, you know, about um, agriculture, 
about a king and a, and a servant, about things that people could understand and could relate to. He could have used very hard examples that no one could understand, but he didn't. He used very everyday examples that everyone could relate to and understand. Indigenous missionaries and clergy. What that means is, um, and you'll see later on when we look at the who, so the examples of some missionaries, um, the best people to preach the gospel to um, are the converts of that culture, or people from that culture, because they understand what people think and how they can relate to them. You know, if I, for example, if I go to China and I'm trying to talk to someone about the gospel, um, well, let's say we can understand each other, but it's going to be um, it's not going to be the same as a Chinese person talk to another Chinese person about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So. This is, um, this is what we mean by indigenous meaning homegrown, people from that culture. And there was um, many saints who went to new areas where they weren't Christian, and they would have only a handful of um, converts that would convert. For example, um, St. Nicholas of Japan, just over 100 years ago. And he, would, he taught them, he trained them up. Then they would go and speak to the other um, Japanese people because they understood the way the Japanese culture and Japanese language and everything works. Um, similar to what St. Paul says, where he says, to the Greek, I became a Greek, to the Jew, I became a Jew. Um, all things to all people, for the sake of Christ, to win them over for the gospel. Same thing. And this is sort of um, a long-term thing, but eventually that um, new, new homegrown church we eventually have a bishop and become self-ruling. This has happened for example in all the self-ruling churches. It's happened in, um, for example in America um, with the Antiochian church there and the um, OCA, Orthodox Church of America. They're self-ruling and that um, gives them a lot of um, flexibility, a lot of ability because they know what's best for them. But that's something that comes down later once, once, they've, um, once the churches have grown big enough and they've got that experience of how to, how to deal with things and understand the orthodox way of, of doing things, if that makes sense. The second approach, approach number two, so I said there was two approaches. Um, it's called the orthodox presence approach. So what do you think that, that is? So I've got an image there of a holy man. His name is um, Saint Seraphim of Sarov. And I'll read you his quote. You've probably heard his quote. Does anyone know it? It's up there. Someone wants to read it out. Acquire inner peace and thousands around you who will find their salvation. Yeah. So what does that mean? How does that work? I think people tend to gravitate towards those they see as at peace. Mm, that's right. Like a ripple effect. Yeah, that's right. So, another way of saying this is um, this compels the Orthodox not to preach the gospel in words, but to imitate Christ by being the gospel, and thereby to preach the gospel in action. Yeah. Christ teaches those who love Him to keep and do His commandments. And He teaches us to let our light shine so that others may see our good works and glorify God. So in short, the Orthodox approach is to live alongside the other and to influence the other by um, your own example of a holy way of life. So... You've probably heard the saying, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. You've probably heard that saying. Similar to that, but I would slightly twist it or change it, I would say, um, preach the gospel, um, but imitate Christ by 
being the gospel. Does that make sense? Which will then reflect in our actions. So there's just another layer of um, from the being to the action. So it actually sinks in. So in other words, the mission is not out there, but it's within. Within where? Within us. Within our body and soul. Within our way of life. The monastics are the greatest historical example and number of this kind of missionary approach. So many examples um, of this type of missionary approach, and St. Seraphim is one of them. Um, last year we had um, two people come to the Orthodox Church, and um, one of them was my, um, became my, um, or became his godparent, my sponsor, and he chose to take St. Seraphim as his patron saint. I, don't, I asked him why, he said he just felt drawn to him and wanted to take him on. So even though St. Seraphim, he's never met him, um, he lived St. Seraphim in a very holy life, that he's still somehow inf influencing and bringing people to orthodoxy, even though he's passed away so many years ago. You know? So there's something about it, something about it that um, we can't fully understand, but it's there and it happens. So as one advances in spiritual sanctification towards theosis, so in a way become, cleaning, purifying ourselves to become like God, as the saints do, others are affected by this transcendent journey of trans transformation. This responsibility of further perfection towards theosis does not fall on a select few individuals or a distinct class. Ex example, missionary or monastic. So, you know, we can't just say, oh, that's, that's for them to be holy and that's for them to go and do this. No, it's, it's for all of us. But it's a calling for all. And indeed, the purpose of human existence as the Orthodox teaches. So the purpose of, of life, people say, what's the meaning of life? I mean, is basically... Um, what St. Athanasius said and other saints have said is that you know God became man so that man could become like God. And that's our whole meaning and life, purpose in life is to work towards becoming more and more in the image of, of God and likeness, which is how God created us. And this is how the Orthodox approach of mission and missionizing works is that you know it's like um it's like a mirror. If you have a mirror and it's, imagine you, you get a mirror and you just cover it, cover it in grease, just from your car or whatever, um, and you try and reflect the sun, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing. You know, it's just going to be dull. It's going to be covered in, in grease. But once we start cleaning that mirror, and that mirror um, becomes clean, it can then reflect the light of the sun. So in the same way, we have God's glory, God's radiance, God's light. You know, we call Him the light of the world. Once we purify ourselves in our body, we can reflect the grace and the holiness of God. It's not us, but we're like a mirror. If that makes sense? Shining onto others and, and hopefully drawing them towards God. If that makes sense? Any questions so far? It's a, big, it's a big thing, it's not, it's not easy. <coughs> okay, so, so we did the why, which was the, the motivations. We did the, um, what, what, the, what we're trying to achieve, the aims. We looked at the two approaches. Do you remember the two approaches? What were they? The incarnation. And Orthodox presence. So now we're up to um, the where. So the why, what, how, where. When we do it. So I've split this up into two areas, um, which I saw some of um, Russian um, Orthodox relations. I have a website, I can give you the link, it's really good. And um, what do you think the first one is? So I've got internal missions. 
internal. Within our church community. Yeah, pretty much. So I'll just bring up the quote. This is from the um, the Russian Orthodox Department for External Church Relations. It's got a very long document that talks about uh, missioning and the church's mission and everything like that. And I've just taken a small um, snippet. So I'll just get someone to read it. The internal mission is addressed to members of the church, including those who are baptised but not sufficiently enlightened in the Orthodox faith and who have no experience of participation in the sacramental life of the church. It is to encourage the spiritual growth of church members. Catechization and religious education constitute an integral part of the mission. Yeah, so what Naj- basically what Nigel said is, you know, and St. Paul said another way, he said to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. You know, um, there's no point in going out there and trying to show Christ to all these people when we have our own Orthodox brothers and sisters who um, don't even know what they have. You know? mm-hmm. So I think this is very important and it should be the most, should be um, probably the primary one, but not always the case because sometimes certain saints have special callings to go to certain regions like St. Paul and things like that. Mm-hmm. The Apostle to the Gentiles. So. <laughs> um, but as a general rule, this would be the first. So then obviously, what does this, what, what do you think the second one is? More baptized. Yeah. So let's get someone to read the next one. The external mission is addressed to those who are outside the church. These adherents of various beliefs and various of various world views, both religious and non-religious secular. It results in initiation of new members into the church and therefore creation of church communities or involvement of new converts in the life of the already existing communities. Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, various world views, non-religious, religious, secular, whatever they might be. Um, it results in the initiation of new members into the church. So that's, um, you know, baptism. We initiate into the church through baptism. Um, and therefore the creation of church communities. So this can happen two ways. Um, they can either, these new um, Orthodox Christians can either become involved in, um, could either be in, involved in the life of already existing parishes or they could have their own. For example, if, um, if a missionary went to a place where there's no Orthodox churches and started, people started converting, wanting to become Christian, they would, they would become new members of the church but they would then have their own new community, community being established. And we see that um, many times in history. So now we come to the who. So I've um, put a small table of some missionaries and, you know, we have a very rich tradition of saints and life of saints. And if we study and learn from them, you know, they can give us shortcuts on how, how we should do things and how to understand things because they're the pioneers, they're the ones who have gone ahead of us and have, um, you know, achieved uh, many, many great and Marvelous work. So I put obviously St. Paul there. Um, and I put the year of their repose. Um, and just some notes. So Apostle to the Gentiles. Um, the Nazis of Egypt, Palestine, Syria, 4th to 6th century. Um, that was a spiritual revival by turning the deserts into cities. So can you give me an example of the second one? Monastic, sorry. Anthony? Yeah, so that is icon upstairs and icon stuff. So there was um, someone who was writing about the desert fathers, and they said they turned the cities into a desert and the desert into the cities. Because they had left the cities, they went to, they, he lived in a cave, people can still visit his cave till today. And, um, and because of his holiness, and he just was just living his life, wasn't, you know trying to do anything rather than just get close to God. And um, these people were coming to him because they, was, you know, they had all these questions and they saw him as a holy man and he could give them answers and he did. 
and we have the saints and the desert fathers and things like that. So, in a way, they're missionaries. Um, mainly, I'd say internal, although there could have been some external. Um, so, the next one, St. Cyril of the Thirties. Anyone heard of them or familiar with them? Yeah? So, basically, um, they're the ones who, who, were, who created the Slavic alphabet. Um, so the, all the Slavic people, they had a language and they used to use runes and they didn't have an alphabet. So because they wanted to give them you know, the gospel, the liturgical service, the writing of saints and, and the rich tradition of the Orthodox Church, they had to, um, rather than forcing those Slavic people to learn a new language, they just created an alphabet in their own language for them. That goes back to what I was saying about using the vernacular, the language of, of the Slavs, the Slavic language, um, even to the point of creating an alphabet for them, just so they could learn and read really and write, which they didn't have before. Um, would you say that's internal or external? Internal. External. So, you know, the... Um, Are we using the same people? That's all. <laughs> what do you mean? I thought they were going out to the community that was already there to teach them. No, um, there's yes. another saint, other saints who did that, but they were going to new people who weren't Orthodox and weren't Christian. They were basically um, pagan, and they um, wanted to become Christian. There's the famous um, story of Prince Vladimir, the Russian prince, that he wanted his nation to have, um, you know, um, a better religion. He said he didn't, didn't really like his religion. So he sent people to different um, parts of the world. Um, from, and he sent people to, to Rome to look at Catholicism back then, to look at um, Islam, someone in the Middle East. And then he sent also to Constantinople, um, to the Church of Holy Wisdom, Hagia Sophia. And the people that went there, they said that. When we um, got to the church, we didn't know where we were. We didn't know whether we were on heaven or on earth, on earth because the worship was so beautiful and so amazing, which it can be in the Orthodox Church. So um, they wrote back to their prince, and, and their prince decided that was a true faith, that was a true religion, and his whole nation would become Orthodox, and they did. Um, prince Vladimir and, and Olga were saints in the Orthodox Church. So the next one said, Bishop. Uh, St. Stephen, Bishop of Perm, the Kumi people, same thing, he created an alphabet for them, a little bit later on. Um, St. Geret, uh, Gerdius, uh, and Vasanithius, the Tatars and Mongols. So they were like, um, I think they were more the Tatars and the Mongols. They had converted to Islam by that stage, the 1500s, and, but they were within sort of the, the area of Russian of Russia, so he was able to talk to them and bring one of them to become Orthodox Christian, and they didn't have an alphabet either, so he he created an alphabet for them in their own language. I know, sorry, that was one above. So Saint Cosmas the Italian, um, Asia Minor and the Balkans. So um, and he's known as the Apostle of Paul. This is what. Nigel was saying, and he's a very good example of internal missionary. So if you want to learn about internal missionary, you can read his life and his writings. And he, um, what had happened is after um, the fall of the East Roman Empire, 1453, the Turks had taken over. And after a couple of generations and a few centuries later, the, Christ the Christians in that Greece area and Turkey area were so um, uneducated, you know, because they were oppressed, they couldn't study their religion and understand their faith. So he was a monk on Mount Athos, and then he um, got a blessing, and he went around visiting all different parts of, of Greece, all little towns of Orthodox Christians, and he would walk into the town, he had a big cross with him, he'd set up the cross, and start preaching um, about Jesus Christ and the Orthodox faith. So he was an internal missionary because they were orthodox, but the people were just living in you know, very um, rural, very um, um, poverty lost way of life that they couldn't have access to education, things like that. So he was very big in education. Um, St. Herman of 
less than. So, um, everyone knows where Alaska is, part of America. He went to the, to the native people then and um, brought them over to Christianity. And Macarius Bukharev in Altai, that's a part in, in Russia, area in Russia. He's got a really interesting story. I'll just, I'll just tell you about it. So he was a monk. He was a, a head to Catholic monk and he got the blessing to go and do missionary work from, from the bishop to these to these um, very warrior tribe people <laughs> that um had you know weren't Christian at all. And um, so he went there, went into the town and just started preaching to them, but no one was interested. No one wanted to have anything to do with him or anything. So he um he got a bit, you know, as you would, a bit upset, a bit cut. And then he left and he was when he went after he left, a thought came to him and he said, You know what? I'm just gonna go and serve them and that's what I wanna do. So he went back and he went back and just served them. So whatever anybody wanted, they wanted the house sweet, whatever they needed to do something, to do this, to do that, he was just doing that. And he didn't mention anything about Christianity or the gospel or anything like that. And um, and he also gave them a lot of types of medicines which they weren't aware of back then, the types of medicines they had. And um, I think it was about three months. After three months of just that virtually being anyone's slave for anything, you know? Who, whoever saw him, they just asked him, oh, can you clean this, can you do this, can you do this? The village slave. And um, three months later, some people started talking to him. And then he um, eventually was able to um, teach them about Jesus Christ and a lot of them became Christian after that. Um, so there's, some others, there's another saying there. If anyone wants the list, you can, I can give it to you later. St. Innocent of Alaska, he's the one in one. He also created the alphabet for the, for the native people over there in that one. St. Nicholas of Japan, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he passed away just, uh, just over 100 years ago. Um, so would St. Nicholas of Japan be internal or external missionary? External. External. Because they were basically <coughs> um, And Confucius and like that. St. Raphael of Brooklyn. So if you read the information there, what do you think? Internal or external? He was good. He was more one. Internal. Internal. So when he went to when he went to America, um, San Rafael, a lot of the um, Orthodox Christians over there, the um, you know the Arab ones, they had no idea about their faith and anything like that. So he worked really hard to educate people to build churches. He established the, the, the magazine, which is still running till today. And you can get the old publications from when he was around as well. Um, and there's, a couple, there's actually two that are still alive, who are put onto the list. So there's one called Archbishop Anastasius Yena Lutius. So he was in East Africa, but now he's in Albania. He's a bishop over there, Archbishop. And um, Father Themi, everyone's heard of Father Themi? Um, in Ken he was in Kenya now in Sierra Leone. Um, internal or external? External. 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 Cool. So now we come to a short history lesson. So now that we've got the basic concept, we've um, seen some examples. What about us here in Australia? So here's some. Um, what's What's that? Can you see? Migrants. Migrants. Immigration. The Orthodox Church followed immigrants fleeing war, persecution, or poverty. So, usually what happens is a holy person or monk or missionary, like St. Paul, like St. Nicholas in Japan, like many others, would go to a new area and establish a new church. In Australia, it was kind of the other way around. 
you know, people came here, immigrants, and then they wanted a church, but they weren't thinking about missionary. They were just thinking about, we need a church for ourselves, mm -hmm. which is still good and important. It's part of the internal mission. So this is what I call transplanting rather than planting. Because when you plant something, it starts fresh and it's new, and that's its environment. But when you transplant it, you're moving it from one place to another. You know, like people have organ transplants or transplant on a tree or something. So the Australian Jasper, the Orthodox Church here, was transplanted, transplanted like a copy and paste from overseas, Greece, you know, Lebanon, Syria, <coughs> Russia, where, wherever, and then brought here. Which isn't the um, the usual usual way of starting new church communities. And then what happened after that? The second and third generations suffered lot, great losses. Right? So, as in they lost uh, people? Yeah. Mm. So there's a lot of, um, you could say like, um, Orthodox descendants of, of the ancestors who are not really part of the Orthodox Church, um, at least not actively, if not at all. Um, and this happened for a few reasons. Um, for example, you know, um, people becoming part of a new culture, you know, someone born in a new place, they're a bit different to their parents, and then the parents not able to relate to them, and things like that, so there becomes a disconnect. Um, from their parents and from the church as well, if the church is able to connect and relate to that new culture that's, that's, that's been born. And um, in terms of missionary work in Australia, what do you guys think about external missionary? From the Orthodox Church? There is a one. There what? There is a one. There virtually isn't. There is um, a bit of internal missionary stuff happening. There is a tiny bit of external. But if we really want to be honest, there isn't much on, on either. But at least there's some internal, but not much. So that, that brings us to the last part. What now? So here we are, 2016. What's the date? September 11th, 2016. <laughs> what now? Here we are. We can learn about the Orthodox theology, the Orthodox approach, understanding the way of life, the, um, the example of the saints, um, what we should be doing, the apostolic attribute of our church that we say every time we read the creed. So, these are my personal recommendations. You guys can take it or you guys can leave it. It's up to you. And this is my personal recommendation. So, keep the three aims that I mentioned in mind. And I said there was going to be a little bit of some questions at the end. So, what were the three aims that I mentioned that we looked at? Reconcile. Yeah. With God. Reconciliation of um, human beings with God and human beings with each other. Glory. Glory to God. Yeah, glorification of God. One more. Think of the Gospels. What was Jesus doing a lot of the time? Healing. 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 So healing, reconciliation, and glorification. And probably in that order, but not necessarily. But that's what the aim, that's what we're hoping to achieve. It's not about numbers, not about anything, it's about those three things I mentioned. So then we looked at the um, approaches, right? The two approaches, the incarnational approach. So the way we understand that God, you know, He loves the Lord, He comes into the world to save it, um, takes on, you know, fallen human nature and things like that. 
the same way we should try and incarnate the gospel to fallen cultures, fallen societies, and try and, you know, um, give them a bit of divinity from God. So we spoke about you'd have to use the vernacular language, strong catechetical education in the vernacular. There's no point in me um, teaching you guys in um, Russian or something or Greek. It's not that I could anyway, but it would be no benefit. And then um, moving towards homegrown um, clergy and missionaries. And later on down the track, like what's happened in America and happened in many places in Orthodox countries today, we um, establish a self-ruling local church with the shop that autonomy we do need to self rule. What was the second approach? I know it's late on Sunday night. So the first approach was incarnational. Incarnational approach. What's the second one? Presence. 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 Very good. Thank you. It's presence approach. And we had the quote from Saint Seraphim. The quiet inner peace and thousands around you will, will find their salvation. And that's about becoming the light to the world that Christ told us we should become. Um, and I said as well, it's about the mission is not out there, it's in, there, in here first. And there's another saying as well, someone said, I don't know who they said that up. You can't give what you don't have. You know, if we don't have holiness, if we don't have Jesus Christ, we can't give it. You know? So we need to get it first. Work on ourselves first. You know that saying? If you want to change the world, change everyone else. But don't change. No, that's not how it goes. Change yourself. That's right, yeah. Similar to that, but in the light of Christ and in God. So this is my recommendation. Begin internally, but prepare to move externally. That's, um, that's my recommendation for us here today, 2016. Any questions? That's so nice. Wow. It'd be nice. It'd be nice if we can make it happen. Mm.